I never knew my mother, for she died seven days after giving birth to me. I was born in a small town called Miao in Sagain Division when the Second World War was coming to an end. My paternal grandfather gave me an uncommon Myanmar name, Neo, which means ruler of the sun because I was born at a time when the Japanese fascists were with their emblem of the sun on their flags were being defeated in Myanmar and also because I was a Saturday born. After the war, the family moved back to Yango and my schooling began at a Catholic missionary school called St. Paul's. From the first year of primary school, we had to study the nursery songs written by our national poet, Mintuwen. He is the only Myanmar poet who is listed among the world's greatest 100 poets. He wrote altogether 13 nursery songs, and they were very popular then as now, and all Myanmar school children can sing them from their hearts. Here is my favorite. The Biedi Kao. Wazo wagao yere jilo, the Biedi me kao su kwe, kaya sujo ho atega, myone meji dwela de, yone sura, ju ne la kwe, mwe naga dao chao pu kwe, do le chao pao du dwazo, o le nwale taga me, dwa kwe, dwa kwe. Professor G. H. Luce translated into English as Rose Apple Gatherers. July, August, rain and flood, let's go pick the ripe rose apple. Hi, take care in thorns and mud, that's where big black leeches grapple. Leeches, bah, the hornless things, I'll fight snakes or serpent kings. Who's afraid? Let's all go now, I'll just leave my coconut cow. Come on, come on. All these songs we had to study by heart and sing in class. When I was one day, when I was in grade two, my Burmese teacher asked me, do you know the poet who wrote this nursery rhyme? I replied, yes, of course, it's Minthuwen. He said, no, no, I mean, do you know him personally? When I said no, he said, the poet is your mother's college sweetheart. I was, I was totally flabbergasted. The whole class went silent, all eyes staring at me. I felt so embarrassed. As soon as I got home, I asked my sister, who was seven years my senior, and she explained everything to me. My stepmother, a very kindly lady, who looked after me so fondly, I had always thought her to be my biological mother. I was shocked, yes, but I was also quite pleased to find out who my real mother was. When I reached middle school, I found both the poems of my mother and of Mintuwa in my textbook again. By that time, all the teachers and students already knew about the two poets and their relationship. I felt quite comfortable learning them. I found my mother's poems to be, well, sensitive, personal, sometimes romantic, sometimes melancholy, whereas Minduwen's poems were always very charming and delightful, sometimes philosophical because he mostly composed about rural life and traditions. Only after studying my poems did I, could I visualize my mother. Of course, I have 
beautiful paintings and portraits of my mother at home, but they look quite lifeless. Her poems resurrected her in my mind. When I was young, every time I was introduced as Kinsomu's son, that's the name of my mother, the first compliment I heard was, oh, your mother was a real beauty. Although I have never seen her in person, I gathered she must have been quite beautiful. But what about her thoughts, her emotions, her feelings? Her poems reveal to me that there was more than beauty in my mother. I found that she was a charming, gentle, affectionate, and kind person, a devoted mother, an obedient daughter, a loving sister, and above all, a dutiful wife. I felt very gratified that she composed all these, poem, these wonderful poems, for without them, I would never have known my mother intimately. My maternal grandparents brought up their children strictly adhering to the customs and traditions of a Myanmar aristocratic family. My grandfather was a senior official in the British colonial service. And he passed on his legacy to his seven children. Amazingly, all seven of them, four sons and three daughters, turned out to be brilliant scholars. When my grandfather passed away, my eldest uncle took his place as head of the family. He was even more strict than my grandfather. The three sisters had to spend all their school and college holidays with him wherever he was posted. There was no chance for my mother to communicate with her friends, or for that matter, her sweetheart, during the long summer holidays. So, they communicated each other in poetry through a very popular journal of that time called Gandaloka. The poems that they wrote during the summer holidays became classics, and they are now included in our school and college textbooks. Here is an excerpt from one of the poems my mother wrote during the long summer months. Le pia ne cha kamuk. Mya kan ta we, tin pia chue di, twe twe kamuk cha kanu tu, le lo le li, ku pun chi di, de wi na mi do ne da ka. Ku le pi sa yuan yu mya twe, yo ya na ga, ban le pia di, da lia na ma ku mu da nge, sao ya na ngu well, this is just an excerpt. In the poem, the butterfly and a particular lotus named Kumudra can never meet because the butterfly comes out only in the daytime and the lotus blooms only with the moonlight. So, the butterfly would sit gently on the leaf all day and beg the lotus but to bloom until the sun sets. When night falls, the lotus would bloom under the moonlight looking for the butterfly till dawn breaks again. It is an emotionally moving poem. I think when my mother wrote it, she was longing to see her sweetheart for sure. And here is another delightful poem written by Mintuwan. It's a poignant but very delightful poem called Ninsi Puen. Le do ga pian, pan jen de kye bu so lo, maung ku ga pe. Mane don si ga, jo son go maung mien do, du se bin Ninsi Puen de ne, gong ten de le. And um, u kien zo, 
rendered very concisely into English as roses. Last eve, her ladyship fancied some flowers we saw on the wildwood way. I plucked them for her, those forest flowers, alas, today. In her hair are roses, roses, very pretty she looks with roses. I think the poet dedicated this poem to my mother again. When my mother finished her final year in college, she had to spend the summer vacation as usual with her eldest brother, my uncle. During the summer holidays, my uncle hastily arranged a marriage between my mother and my father. My uncle was then the district commissioner in Pie, and my father was the deputy district commissioner. Both my father Ubatint and my uncle Utentut were belonged to the very elite IC, uh, Indian civil service called ICS. The British chose the outstanding scholars in college and sent them to UK for further studies and trained them exclusively to be part of the British colonial service. In those days, they were the creme de la creme. My mother, always an obedient sister, did not make any protestations, but accepted her fate as wife of a senior government official. During the same period, Myanmar literature was enriched with an immortal short story written by Mintuwa called Baji Aung Nyade, which means Uncle Aung broke his promise. It is a touching story about a 10-year-old village lad who fell in love with a wooden statue of a maiden. He loved art and he visited the village sculptor Ua frequently and watched him create beautiful pieces of sculpture out of figureless blocks of wood. He thought the figurine of the maiden was the prettiest he had sight, he had set his eyes upon. So one day, he could not help but ask very timidly the sculptor how much it will cost to purchase that statue. When the sculptor said one rupee, it nearly broke his heart. For he never had that kind of money and he was getting just one pice a day for pocket money. In the colonial days, we had to use the Indian currency of rupees, annas, and pice. One rupee meant 64 pice. Nevertheless, he begged the sculptor to keep it for him, for one day he would come back when he had saved enough money for it. The sculptor gave him his solemn promise that he would not sell it to anyone. So the poor lad stopped eating his favorite snacks and started saving his pocket money in a bamboo container. Every evening before he went to bed, he would take out all the coins and count them. It was such a slow process. So he decided to supplement his income by doing menial jobs like fetching water and gathering firewood for his neighbors. When he had saved enough, almost enough, he went to inform the sculptor that in a few days' time he would be able to buy it. But alas, the sculpture was there no more. The sculptor told him apologetically that a high-ranking government inspector had just taken it away. The poor boy was so brokenhearted, he didn't eat or sleep or talk to anyone for days. No one knew why. Soon, a severe fever inflicted him and he lay dying in bed. Before he died, he asked his mother to donate all his savings in the bamboo container 
to the village monastery. His last words were, Baji Ao Nyare, which means Uncle Ao did not keep his promise. A very poignant yet human story that created classic literature, the likes of which usually outlived those who poured their emotions into it. The writer, my mother, my father, my uncle, all the models have passed away. The poems and the stories, the immortals, still live on. The short story became a very popular play, and it is still performed at Bogoda festivals all over the country. The village folk and the kids know this story for many decades. Last year, I think, at a, Yango, at a literary festival in Yango, it was presented by a famous stage director, and it was the main attraction at the festival. Well, that's the story of my mother. Long gone, but immortalized by her poems and the poems and stories of Mianthuwen. To this day, the Ma literati still argue and debate about who the poets were referring to when they wrote these masterpieces. I think that matter is irrelevant now because what it matters is that they have become truly masterpieces in Myanmar literature that will exist long after all of us are gone. People's love for literature is dying globally. And the electronic devices that can make it more accessible to readers are not helping at all because the present generation feels that there are better uses for these devices than reading classical literature. Education has, today has become job-oriented. The world has become a place where you need vocational skills to survive. True, jobs feed your stomach. But what about the heart? What about the soul? It is literature, it is poetry that feeds the heart and soul and also makes you human. In conclusion, I would like to quote an adage of Lord Buddha. Lord Buddha once asked, how can you distinguish L-I-K-E -E like from L-O-V-E -E love? He said, when you like a flower, you pluck it. But when you love a flower, you water it daily. He said, if you understand this, you will understand life. Thank you very much.